silver will probably catch up, not immediately, but uh, at some point. And I think psychologically, the $30 level for silver holds the same kind of key ingredient that uh, once we're at 30, a lot of the Wall Street silver crowd that came in and most, for the most part, have hold on, uh, held on and dollar cost average and keep stacking, they'll be rewarded psychologically. I think it's the uh, concerns in the financial markets, the system, what's going on with these uh, overreach of the political class in all jurisdictions, a lot of fear um, and uncertainty. So it drives people into the safe harbor and there's nothing safer on a decentralized basis than the precious metals. Any round number, especially in the thousands, is a big psychological event. So $2,000 gold in U.S. terms is a big deal. So it's got to you know, trade above 2000 and stay there. And once that's accomplished, there'll be a bit of a readjustment to the mindset of everyone that's uh, in the market or going to participate in the market, meaning that 2000 will become the floor and everyone will think that uh, how high above 2000 is it going to go? Is it going to go 3000 5000 10000 whatever. So... It does set a precedence for the, let's say, rethinking the market. Silver will probably catch up, not immediately, but uh, at some point. And I think psychologically, the $30 level for silver holds the same kind of key ingredient that uh, once we're at 30, a lot of the Wall Street silver crowd that came in and most, for the most part, have hold on, uh, held on and dollar cost average and keep stacking, they'll be rewarded psychologically. At thirty dollars silver, that okay, I bought it at you know twenty eight, twenty nine, some point at thirty. Although it wasn't there for very long on the spot price, but many of these people, as you well know, Elijah, are paying you know thirty five, thirty six. In the case of the Silver Eagle, maybe even forty dollars an ounce because the premiums are so high. But again, coming back to the thirty, psychologically you feel better when the spot price was twenty five and you bought it for thirty. Then a price gets to 30, you actually net zero on a fiat basis. But psychologically, it's moved $5 and feel Well, obviously, you just said it. I mean, they're very tight, you know, supply and a very big demand. The only reason people continue to pay a premium is because they want it. They want it now. And normally, uh, you know, whatever normal means these days. But, uh, you know, in years past, when we saw these spikes, like happened in 2008, we saw you know, $9 on the paper price and $13 on eBay. And many of the dealers that we both know were selling silver around 12 or 13, even though the paper price was three or $4 lower, but that only lasted for a short time. I'm going to say two months. I wrote an article about it and there was an arbitrage situation going on as, you know, you just mentioned, I mean, back the local dealer here. So why don't you put your hundred ounce bars up on your website and sell them for 13 and, uh, you pocket that $4 delta by the thousands and then, you know, convert the thousands to hundreds when the premium drops. So I said that to make the point that there is robust demand in silver to keep the premiums high and staying high. Uh, they have subsided very slightly. And I, you know, I'll take some guilt. Um, you know, one of the programs, and there's very few that I sponsor, I don't really sponsor this one, I'm an associate of it, but uh, this ONEX that's on my blog, you buy into part of a silver uh, commercial bar. So you're getting it near spot. But when you convert, I mean, you could convert to the silver spot price and pay very little above that to get the silver, but that's a thousand ounce form. And who does that? Very few. So you take your portion of it, you've got 126 ounces, you can get 100. 10 delivered, and now you pick, do you want silver eagles? Do you want silver rounds? Do you want 10 ounce bars? And you pay that premium. So I was encouraging people to buy through that system and wait for the premiums to come down. The premiums aren't coming down. So I think we're in a new market here and sooner or later, something's got to give. I mean, the arbitrage is for anyone that can fabricate silver to buy up as much as they possibly can and put it on the shelf at $25 
and punch out, you know, rounds at $30 as fast as they can all day, every day till the market adjusts. So if we're looking at a system that will be central bank digital currencies where they have complete control, then it's, well, how do you get everybody into that system? Do they voluntarily do it? Well, if you have a false flag or an actual event, could be nature, let's see, they say you have a big CME and it wipes out you know, the uh, cyberspace for a while might not wipe out the world's internet connection, but let's say it wipes out a good portion of, uh, let's say, the East Coast of the United States, as an example. And it's only down for, you know, a couple of days or so. And that would be the perfect crisis. Let's never let a crisis go to waste, where I would say, well, you know what? We've got a real problem here. We've got to, you know, beef up our, uh, you know, our ability to weather these type of solar storms. But what we really found out is we're having trouble with identification. So now what we need to do is make certain that you are who you say you are. And what we need to do is have a very, very uh, explicit way of mating you to your financial ability to transact anywhere, internet or out in the real world. So that's the digital ID. That's the idea that it's your fingerprint, your retina scan, your blood sample, your hair sample, your fingernail, whatever. It probably will be put into a, into a DNA database where your identity is your DNA. And once that's accomplished, they, they have absolute complete control because you could be part of a corporation or a limited liability company or whatever, but your anonymity is gone. You're basically track, traced, and tax, no matter what you do. And I think that's the ultimate goal. So in my conspiracy hat, I think that anything along those lines, Elijah, where you would see some disruption in cyber attack, solar storm, grid down, those type of scenarios, you'll see a trial balloon, I'm almost certain, where this push for a more complete digital identity will be enacted. But uh, so let's say that it is, let's say that they try their just, you know, modern money theory and you can just print to infinity. And as long as you've got a digital ID, you're in the system. It doesn't matter how much you print, you get your universal basic income and you own nothing, but you're happy. All right. Well, let's say that doesn't work. There's too much of a pushback. So then the elites say, OK, well, we're going to tie it to gold. Uh, you can't have the gold, but it's tied to gold. So we're going to limit the supply. It's not modern money theory anymore. We're limited by our gold pool and it's this. All right, fine. But though at that time, all the time before, during or after that possibility, there'll be a real gold market. And it's called the black market, but it's really the free market. And that's where people in and of themselves will make transactions in precious metals. So they'll sell their car for gold or silver. They'll rent their home for it. They'll trade for food. They'll do whatever. That's the real market. Of course, it will be possibly in the future. It will be not only looked down upon, but maybe will be illegal. I put those illegal in quotation marks because it's really illegal not to, not to settle in, in metal. In the, if you're in the United States and you're settling a debt to the state, I mean, they're not supposed to accept anything but gold or silver. So you know, I've often thought I should call up my tax assessor and ask him a question, tell him I've been frauding him for all these years. And I'm really, really upset because I've been paying him in these tokenized digital receipts called Federal Reserve notes that I haven't settled in honest money. And am I going to go to jail? But uh, not too many people think backwards like that. But it is a humorous take on how how the law has been perverted to such a degree that most people, even the Federal Reserve Chairman, cannot tell you what money is. But I would put it uh, on a tier basis below having extra food or a way of making income that's outside of, uh, let's say, the corporate structure. So let's say that you're, um, well, let's say some real simple like house cleaning. I mean, there are people still with money They'll pay you to clean their house or their car or, you know, work in their garden or whatever. So that's one thought. The other one is having extra food because food's going to become more and more valuable as you press through this 
breakdown of the system. I mean, just having the knowledge and not acting on it is not that useful. Uh, so, you know, even though the Congress critters and a lot of the political class are bought and paid for, not all of them are. And they actually fear us, even though they don't act like it. You know, if we had enough people that rallied and said, you know, hell no, we're not doing this. Uh, it, it, it does upset the apple cart. And so I think one is to just as simple as an email, although a phone call is far superior and you usually get an answering machine to say, hey, bill number one, two, three, four, five, that says I have to uh, submit to your digital ID is outside of, you know, my belief system. We don't need this. You've had my bank account based on the information I gave you. I've got a government ID. That's all that's required. I don't want it. You know, and they get the phone's backed up like that, or they see people talking about it and they're willing to stand up in the street or that type of thing, doesn't guarantee that it'll stop it, but it could slow it down and it could end it. Uh, so we do have power if we unite. Uh, and we don't have to be all of us, but enough of us to put the idea that we're not going to stand for this nonsense. Complete control. I mean, it, that's what it means if it's implemented on a, you know, on a worldwide basis or in a jurisdiction. I mean, it could be, it's in China now and uh, it, it's horrible. I mean, you know, it's based on a social credit score more than what your credit worthiness is. I mean, the old financial system of yesteryear was based on your ability to repay a loan and you got a credit score and had nothing to do with your political ideology or how many times you saluted, you know, so-and-so the system that we are watching unfold before our eyes has very explicit demands on the human population and you're either going to conform or you're not and i think we're getting to that point uh, rather rapidly <laughs>